Uh, my name is Dr. Dean Donahue. I'm a thoracic surgeon here at Mass General. Uh, I specialize in treating a condition called thoracic outlet syndrome, or TOS for short. Uh, and we've developed a, a specialized program that, that focuses on treating patients with that condition. Thoracic outlet syndrome is a series of symptoms that develop due to compression of structures within the part of the body we call the thoracic outlet, which is essentially the area from the neck to the underarm, uh, the region that passes below the collarbone. And there's a very complex anatomy in that region. There's nerves and blood vessels that can be compressed and irritated. And depending upon what's compressed and how severely it's compressed, patients can produce a, or present with a lot of different uh, symptoms. So for neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, the most common symptom is pain. And that can be in the neck, it can be in the upper part of the chest, either by the shoulder blade or under the collarbone area. It can be uh, any location down the arm. There can be symptoms of different sensation, such as tingling sensation in the arm or numbness where you have less sensation in the arm or the hand. And occasionally patients will have weakness or, or kind of a clumsiness of the arm or the hand as well. So I think TOS really is a combination of the anatomy that you were born with combined with the activities that you do. And it might just be your usual daily activities or repetitive uh, arm activities or being involved in a traumatic situation like a car accident or a fall. Thoracic outlet syndrome can present if you're anatomically predisposed to having compression within the thoracic outlet and there are certain activities or events that can occur that cause trauma in, in that area such as repetitive overhead motion, a lot of throwing athletes or just swimmers, repetitive overhead uh, actions or work-related repetitive upper extremity activities, or a direct trauma, either a direct blow or a fall or a car accident that can trigger an injury in that area. And if there is anatomic compression in that region already, it may prevent what would otherwise be an injury that can recover into something that doesn't recover. The best estimate is it occurs in around three out of every 100,000 patients. Uh, it's actually not very common as a, as a condition compared to you know, other conditions that can cause pain in this region, such as shoulder issues or cervical spine issues. Uh, and there can be a lot of overlap in terms of the symptoms. So it can be, it can be a bit of a difficult uh, condition to try to sort out. There are different forms of thoracic outlet syndrome depending on which structure is being compressed. The most common uh, form is what's called neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome where the nerves of the, of the brachial plexus, those are, that's a collection of nerves that come out from the neck and then run to the chest and the arm where that gets compressed. But also the artery leading, uh, carrying blood down the arm can be compressed or the vein bringing blood back from the arm can be compressed as well. the severity of pain can really vary uh, between individuals um, and the characteristics can also be quite different as well. It can be more of a dull ache uh, in either the neck or the chest or the arm. It can be more of a sharp pain, a burning pain, a searing pain. It really can vary a lot. My general philosophy is really to try non-surgical treatment first and most of the patients that come here end up not needing surgery. I think we have a lot of good uh, tools at our disposal that can help treat patients without having to resort to surgery. Uh, and that's things like some of the injections that we do into the neck and the upper part of the chest, some experienced physical therapy. Uh, but there are a lot of other different types of treatment options that don't involve surgery that can be effective. And usually it's a combination of different things that will, that will work, not just one thing. Thoracic outlet syndrome can develop either in one side or both sides. It can be what we call unilateral or bilateral. So one of the real challenges of this condition is that there is no test that will absolutely prove that a patient has thoracic outlet syndrome or prove that they don't have thoracic outlet syndrome. So making the diagnosis really involves a combination of you know, a, a good careful history, listening to not only what their symptoms are, but to how they arrived at that spot, how they began, how they've evolved over time, 
what the different testing results have been, what I learned from a, a, a physical examination of the patient. And then we've designed a few tests here that have been very helpful. Uh, one of our radiology colleagues has designed a specialized CAT scan of the thoracic outlet that really provides a lot of good anatomic detail. Uh, and knowing that anatomy combined with knowing what a patient's symptoms are and knowing what their exam shows really does help to either become more or less suspicious of this as a, as a condition. But the other uh, treatment or uh, diagnostic test that we do involves injecting some of the muscles that control the thoracic outlet directly with a muscle relaxant using ultrasound to guide those injections. And we found those to be uh, very helpful as well, not only in gathering information about what might be causing the symptoms, but in sometimes as a, a, a supplemental treatment plan as well. There, there's a lot of different conditions in this region, the, you know, the thoracic outlet area, the, the neck, the cervical spine is a very complex anatomic region, the shoulder is a very complex anatomic region, and the thoracic outlet sits directly between the two, and that's a very complex anatomic region. So there's a lot of different possible explanations for symptoms in this region. And many of them also don't have specific tests that can definitively rule them in or rule them out. And so I think the keys really are to keep an open mind and just let, you know, the process tends to evolve over time. You know, in my experience, things do become a little bit clearer over time. Not that we want to drag this out indefinitely, but I think the more times you hear a patient's story and examine them, the more data you can gather, the more likely you are to, to make the diagnosis. Because the symptoms of thoracic outlet syndrome uh, overlap a lot with cervical spine issues in the neck or shoulder issues, many patients have traveled down that initial evaluation pathway and haven't come up with an answer yet. So I'd say the things that TOS is most commonly mistaken for are, are issues in those regions. Thoracic outlet syndrome can be difficult to treat, first of all because of the anatomic complexity of the thoracic outlet and the fact that the diagnosis itself can be, can be challenging. Uh, and so first of all, getting the diagnosis correct I think is, is step one. And then secondly, you know, it does take a fair bit of experience I think to uh, treat this non-surgically. We're very fortunate here to have really experienced therapists and really good uh, radiologists that can do a lot of ultrasound guided injections that have been very helpful. Thoracic outlet syndrome can worsen over time, although I, I also think there are a lot of patients that are treated non-surgically that can make a complete recovery. So it really is an individual path that every patient has and, and there's really no one answer to, to that question. So the goal of the operation is to provide a complete decompression of the thoracic outlet. And so there's lots of different ways to approach that part of the body, the thoracic outlet. Uh, and I've, I think I've done all of the different types of operations you can do to, to decompress the thoracic outlet. My approach is to do an incision above the collarbone or a supraclavicular approach. I just feel having done all the alternative types of approaches that really provides the best exposure and the, the best ability to do a thorough complete decompression which I think really is the most important part of treating this condition. The goal is to take pressure off of the nerves and allow the body's own healing process to occur and allow a nerve to recover. Now nerves heal very slowly and there can be a form of permanent nerve damage that's already occurred even before surgery and so there may not be a complete 100% recovery of their symptoms, but the vast majority of patients do improve significantly after surgery.